Welcome to the Codependency Inside Out podcast with your host, counselor and trauma recovery coach, A.J. Mahari. This podcast will explain and examine codependency's many traits and painful relational challenges and why you need a healthy relationship to and with yourself, as well as why it's important to get into a healing and recovery process. Please visit ajmahari.ca to purchase and book sessions with A.J. Mahari. Generally, what's going on with codependency and how is it perceived by people and why are people often reticent to accept that they might well have codependency? Because the first thing I want to say is that it seems like codependency has this really bad rap of its own. Like if you're codependent, somehow that's your fault. Or if you're codependent and you've been in a relationship with a borderline or a narcissist, I think some people have misunderstood me on the internet. I've seen things they write on these forums and stuff. As well, you know, AJ Mahari said that we are responsible for what the borderline did to us. No, no. People with BPD are always responsible for what they do. They don't know that. They don't take that personal responsibility if they're untreated. But what I've said about that is what codependents are responsible for is getting out of there, is taking care of yourself. So it's not that you're responsible for what they do to you at all. A codependency isn't your fault. You're not to blame codependency or counterdependency, by the way. But focusing on codependency here, you're not to blame for anything that's happened to you. But you do, as an adult, have a responsibility now to understand if you do have codependency and what does that mean? Because so many people do have codependency, and there is a cultural codependency, and I'll talk about that at another time. But so many people have codependency. That is the type of codependency. The causative factor is adverse childhood experience, being really hurt at least once or more, or experiencing your needs not being met consistently in childhood, or outright trauma can create codependency, which I strongly believe in a lot of the research I've done. And of course, there are a lot of opinions out there about this because it's not, quote, nailed down by psychiatry, unquote, as if that's really that important. But you know, some people think it is. So codependency is kind of in a no man's land of understanding often. Many people will say a lot of things about it I totally don't get or disagree with. I mean, I disagree with fervently, and I hope that what I bring to you will resonate for you and be helpful for you. Because codependency, in many people's minds, seems to have become this, quote, bad word. And it's not. And is it a label of sorts? Well, we have, yes, it is, because we have a lot of labels, don't we? And it's like BPD and NPD and codependency and many other things. I'm not one who really ascribes to the labels or the labels are the most important thing to me by any means because we're stuck in this linguistic box. How are we going to communicate to each other about what it's like to be a codependent, maybe who just got discarded by a narcissist or ghosted by a borderline, and all this pain you're in and why? And of course, it has to do with the borderline or the narcissist, but it can also be Well, codependency emanates from childhood in family of origin and in various different ways that are unique to many individuals. It's not the same patterns. It's not the same experience. But the woundedness is very describable across most people with codependency because of what it actually means and the patterns that are actually within codependency that most people with codependency will, to one degree or another, be enacting these patterns because you learned them in childhood and it wasn't your fault. So I think a lot of people think that codependency is this blame word that means you're bad or you did something wrong or you're somehow to blame for everything that is either happening in your life or why you might not be in the kind of relationship or, or, you know, or you've had a pattern of 
really unhealthy, rocky, tumultuous, painful relationships because you've been with borderlines and or narcissists. I've had clients who've been, you know, in like a marriage maybe with a narcissist, and then they get out of the marriage eventually or uh, different periods of time. Maybe children involved, maybe not. And then, so, like a lot of people with codependency, they want to get to that next relationship right away because it's hard to be alone or just, you know, you don't feel very good all by yourself. Codependency is a dysfunctional relationship to and with self. And what that really means, I like to describe more to each individual client because it's so individual at how it affects people's lives. Codependency happens in childhood. It's a trauma response. It's an adverse a response to adverse childhood experiences, which can be major trauma or could be many other different ways that you got hurt and are affected by things. But it's an inculcation. It's like really poor training that like no parent probably does on purpose. Uh, but if you have a borderline or a narcissist parent, narcissistic parent, they're not going to know what they're doing and they're not going to know how they're affecting you. And more to the point, they're not even going to care. And that creates a lot of codependency and that creates a lot of pain for people. But I'm just wanting to really say in this episode of this podcast that codependency is not your fault. Codependency doesn't mean you're a bad person. People with codependency to varying degrees do lack self-esteem, do have low self-esteem and low self-worth. And do focus so much on others because you were trained to do that in childhood. And when we are children, okay, when any human being is a child, and maybe a par maybe parents are fighting, and in some people's cases, like maybe mom hits dad or dad hits mom, and it's really scary when you're like five years old or six years old or seven years old. And there is an innate powerlessness there and helplessness because you're a child. And you can't fight back and you can't change them and you can't make anything better, but you'll try. And then often for people with an emotionally unavailable parent, whether they be borderline narcissistic or not, and other issues, but this will just be the example I'll go with here. The emotionally unavailable parent, people throughout their childhood, d does not see you and does not hear you, does not attend to the needs that they don't see or hear, or that they're not attuned to. And this is very wounding. And this is another reason, a core reason, why people end up with codependency. And so it's childhood woundedness that's not your fault. Then sets up a child to pursue the emotionally unavailable parent, for whatever reason they are that way, sets up a child each and every single child that experiences this to one degree or another in their family of origin and childhood. It sets you up for this pattern of pursuing what you actually deserve to just be given and what you need as a child to be given for healthier development. When there's this woundedness of the pursuing, or in some cases, you, you know, you absolutely parentified by one parent because maybe maybe in some people's cases like dad was a narcissist or dad cheated on mom and left or the opposite right and then the the family breaks up the marriage breaks up there is some abandonment to that and it's not as deep or profound as those who have bpd or even npd it happens a lot when mom is there with it happens to girls and boys. I've had clients express to me, and, and male clients in this situation, that, you know, they end up sleeping in bed with their mother way beyond an age where that's appropriate, but like nothing else untoward happens, but that they're being relied on and they're being parentified as being put in the partner role in other every other way, but, you know, intimately, physically. And of course, sometimes that happens to children too, but like that's not what I'm talking about here. And so when this happens, it's a parentification, it's enmeshment, it becomes an unconscious collusion that isn't your responsibility. You're the child. The parent is 
putting all this into your experience in a way that you don't have any ability to counter or any power or any uh, empowerment or even understanding, depending on how old you were, to be able to not be wounded by this. And parentification takes many forms, not just the one example I gave, which is a pretty severe example. But within parentification, there's also emotional incest. And the same could be said for infantilization, which happens to children, which can cause uh, the trauma response of codependency as well. And so emotional incest is considered to be a form of sexual abuse. It is not physical sexual abuse, but then sexual abuse isn't limited to just what people think it is, the ultimate, right? A penetrative act of, you know, uh, forceful, unwanted, inappropriate, or because sexual abuse can be many other things that have nothing to do with the physicality that sexual abuse is often just thought of as. But so it has a wider definition than the actual physical sexual abuse that many children, um, unfortunately, do encounter. And the thing about that is, I know in my experience as a child, I was not only sexually abused by five adults, two of them were my parents, not, not at once, right? Different times, over different periods of time. And remembering some of it, and in the case of my father repressing it totally until I was in therapy and wow, like it just, it just came out. It was horrific. It was so scary. But the thing about it is not all sexual abuse is physical and emotional incest happens with parentification or infantilization. And sometimes you could have like a narcissistic parent where they have to be right all the time and you can't do anything right. And in a way, and I, and I don't want to go too deep into this right now, but in a way that is them infantilizing you and with gaslighting and you don't know what you're talking about and you're not good enough for this and you don't do this right and you don't do that right. And then like age appropriately, right? They're not seeing you and they're not hearing you and they're definitely abusing you and they're gaslighting you. And then that is a form of, of with the infantilization of you're just like useless, they say, or think, or whatever, then, and they might not use those words, then what's a child going to do with that, right? The child feels abandoned. It's very, very painful. It is very wounding, and yet not everybody responds the same way. Infantilization or parentification of a child put children into roles of too much responsibility and externalizing out worrying about parents feelings and emotional incest can be partly that and it's also when you're being used as a substitute for say ex-husband or ex-wife or whatever that is putting you in a role that you have they have no right to put you into and so infantilization parentification, and the many other ways in which people are wounded in childhood that they might not think about or consciously be aware of growing up because you're too busy surviving and just thinking this is the way that it is. It's one incredible or a series of incredible, incredibly painful betrayals of what you actually need and deserve in a parent from parents. So codependency, again, is not your fault. And it does come from woundedness, neglect, adverse experience, or to tra traumatic experience, because it's not the same for everybody who has codependency. And everybody who has codependency doesn't have it in the exact same way necessarily. Why do people have codependency in versus the people that end up with BPD or NPD? And when I say end up with, I shouldn't have really put it that way because it's so important to realize that there are overlaps across all three, but that doesn't mean that people with just codependency, not to minimize, will have BPD or NPD. Some do, some don't. 
Codependency isn't this blaming your bad, awful person, everything's your fault word. Uh, I really want to get that out there because I don't know if people just say that straight up plainly. With a parentification or infantilization or emotionally unavailable parent or, you know, combinations of said in people's childhoods, whatever might have occurred, because it's different in different people's childhoods, obviously, and the dysfunctional family of origin, the enmeshment, the codependent patterns, you're learning them because you're trying to get the attention and the care and the nurture that you deserve as a child. Because without that, and with, with the lack of emotional safety that goes with those unmet needs and or worse if you're being abused as well, then, or not heard or not seen, which is kind of a form of abuse, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's not going too far to say that, then it sets up a pattern of pursuit. And that pursuit for what you need as a child, especially the younger you are, but even early teens, people, kids have needs and they need things from parents and, you know, support and validation, nurture. And I know when, pe when kids get into their teens, maybe sometimes they don't so much want to hear what their parents have to say, but if their parents are positive and healthier, you know, they... It's just much better for them. And so this goes into the teen years for people often too. But usually there's some woundiness before adolescence. And so it sets up this pursuit pattern, among other things, where you're trying to get seen and heard by a parent or both parents if they're both emotionally unavailable. We don't know this as kids, right? Really? Maybe some kids do. But I know in my childhood I didn't, but I was pursuing because I wasn't getting anything emotionally from my parents. or a lot, I had a lot of unmet needs aside from abuse. And it it's like, so you're trying to please them and you're trying to fix them and you're trying to rescue them sometimes if there's been a breakup between your parents or your mom sitting there crying because whatever her issues are, but she's crying. And when mom cries we don't feel too safe. And maybe even when dad cries, if a dad cries. Because, you know, I want to just keep on reiterating that men deserve to feel feelings too. You know, a lot of men think that that's not okay. I'll leave it at that. But the thing is, so it, let's just take the example of mom. So if mom is crying, because I've heard this from so many clients, my mother was always upset or my mother was always controlling. My mother's always arguing with my father, telling us what to do never listening to what we needed or what we felt. And of course, the older you get, you can talk more about that. And so this leads people to the rescuing, pursuing, trying to fix, trying to please other to get your needs and more importantly, even your safety needs, your, you know, to feel safe. So you have this threat to your survival when you don't feel emotionally safe. And lots of kids go through that, don't know what that is, or what's happening, but that's often what's happening. One of the things I want to add at this point is that there's a lot of similar situations in dysfunctional families of origin that might see if there's multiple kids, right? Say there's three or four kids. You could actually see out of these dysfunctional families with, you know, certain different things that occur or some similar things that occur across some of these families, you could actually see one or two codependent children, a borderline and a narcissist in a really dysfunctional family. That would be more or less likely to happen with, when there's a cluster B parent. But the point is, so when you have, if you have codependency, First of all, it's not a big bad word, like I said. It doesn't mean you're to blame. It doesn't mean you're guilty. It doesn't mean you're awful. It doesn't mean anything like that. It just means you've been wounded too and that you were able to adapt to the woundedness in this codependent way, which is really painful and formidable, but that you didn't have the same kind of responses as those who, who will get diagnosed with BPD or NPD do. So this can happen in one family of origin. If there were four kids, you could have two 
two people grow up with codependency. One gets diagnosed with NPD and one gets diagnosed with BPD. Well, how could that be possible? Well, I mean, I always think about object relations to explain these things, but what I know that is known, uh, you know, there's a lot being said now about if BPD and they, they're in studies claiming they might have a genetic marker or a um, actual elements of the DNA or whatever, like, you know, numbers and etc., that they can say, well, the this is a demarcation, a delineation of this is, you know, blah, 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 causation to some degree or other. Well, I don't think that's been in any way, shape, or form proven. So if it ever is, okay. But in the meantime, we really don't know. So what I'm just going to offer you here is what I know that is known for sure, which is people that are born with a sensitive to very sensitive temperament that meets with an invalidating abuse of dysfunctional family of origin or environment, much more likely to develop BPD or even NPD. And so what about the codependent? Well, what's the difference? Just to keep it simple, the major difference that we know about is that people with codependency have a more resilient temperament than people who often end up with BPD or NPD. is not the only reason. But some people say, I've had so many clients say this too, like that they have a sibling with BPD or one with BPD, one with NPD, a parent with NPD, whatever the case. And that's not always the case for people with codependency. So you've been really wounded, but you think that you're okay because you're a functioning adult to, to, to pretty much, you know, a fairly decent degree for most people with codependency, except for maybe in relationships. But like in your life, in your work, in your career, with friends, you know, you're, you're probably doing reasonably well. And then you can't figure out, well, what happens all of a sudden? And why do I feel like I'm losing myself? And you're in a relationship with a borderline or a narcissist and it triggers back, maybe still in, in your unconscious, it triggers that wounded inner child. And that wounded inner child is always seeking unconsciously the reparation through other, not in a way that people with BPD are, uh, it's different and it's more profound and etc. But people with codependency, the wounded inner child is seeking reparation. And that's what kind of leads you unbeknownst to your conscious awareness that when you're attracted to, you know, person A, person B, whoever you're attracted to, that what's also happening, especially when you're getting attracted to somebody with BPD or NPD and you can't know that in the beginning the very first time, because some people do it more than once, then it's like your inner child is like a Geiger counter to, yeah, if it's got any similarity whatsoever, let alone for some people, absolute sameness, people with BPD or NPD, to the chaos and the drama and and and, and the whole roller coaster ride and the walking on the eggshells that maybe you experienced in childhood to varying degrees. And so that's happening in your unconscious. You know, people with codependency, like the reason that it didn't get in the diagnostic statistical manual for whatever that thing is really worth, um, I, I think it's important to look at things and understand things and what people are dealing with so that we can help people. But I don't think that we need to pathologize humanity to the degree that that does. And I've read numerous studies on different things, uh, more so... Well, some on codependency now, and they're looking to really make that a pathological model as well. And this, there's a person on YouTube who, had, who calls it self-love deficit disorder already, pathologizing it. But codependency just escaped being a personality disorder in the DSM because in the, in the mid-80s, by, by, you know, an inch or two, because they just said it was overlapping too much with BPD and dependent personality from cluster C. And what does that mean, right? And I'll be breaking that down more here. It doesn't mean that you're like on the verge of being a borderline. It just means that you might have gone through similar things, but usually not as primal core as young in age as people with who develop BPD or get diagnosed with it later or even NPD, but that you had a more resilient temperament 
but it doesn't mean that you escaped without woundedness. And what is that woundedness that is in common and it doesn't manifest the same way or to the same degree between people with codependency, borderlines, and narcissists? Core shame wounds. And of course, they're much more profound than borderlines than codependents in a way much more damaging to borderlines at a younger age and much more damaging to narcissists. But that doesn't mean they're not really formidably painful and they've caused people with codependency a lot of pain and damage as well. It's just these things don't all manifest the same way. But the core shame wounds, because whenever a child doesn't have their needs met or they're not seen or heard or you're infantilized or parentified and you're in this role to try to, you know, you need to try to get the parent to be okay so maybe they'll meet your needs. Only so often, all that work on the child's part to try to soothe, calm down, you know, the parent, and maybe you, you, maybe you do help them sometimes with that when you're a child. And then that gives you more hope that you can do that with the borderline or the narcissist, which isn't really positive or healthy, but it isn't your fault. And the thing is, even when you could do that with a parent, chances are you still didn't get your needs met. You still didn't get what you deserve to be given in the first place because you were a precious child who deserved love and nurture and not chaos and drama and whatever you might have experienced. And for some people with codependency, it's not that stark, but it's still very wounding. And I think the other thing to consider about this is that when we are children, you know, human beings, and quote, we are animals as well, unlike most other animals, we are the most helpless when born, and we need the most, well, maybe because we have reasoning and a little bit of difference from the other animals out there, but we need so much to go pretty okay within boundaries, right, a certain you know, because outside of that boundary is going to cause, you know, codependency or more outside that boundary of need um, and, and how wounded someone gets going to cause BPD or NPD or other issues for people. So the thing is, human beings, young children, 8, 9, 10-year-old children even, to early teens, but it doesn't usually start in um, adolescence, codependency either, really do need what you absolutely need. We need nurture. We need validation. We need reassurance. We need some rah-rah, you know. We need parents to be behind us. I, I have no concept of what that would be like because it never happened for me. I know I know what it's like. I've seen friends with their kids and how that, but I don't know what it feels like as a kid because it was absent, right? But the point is, we need so many of these things. So codependency is formidable. I believe it is appropriate and correct based on all the research I've done, and I'm doing more, and I'll be talking about that, that codependency really is a mental health challenge, mental health issue. doesn't mean it's a personality disorder. But something that is alarming, I've noticed, you could go take a look around for yourself, I've never put in, I don't think I searched codependent personality disorder or codependent personality, but I found a lot of blogs, pages, some by professionals that they're just calling it codependent personality or codependent personality disorder. So that's a little bit, is that foreshadowing something coming in the DSM or is that just, what is that? I wonder, because I don't know. It's alarming, though, I think, because could we compare codependency? Could it fit into the framework of a personality disorder? Well, probably, maybe, but, I mean, I'm someone who doesn't really, not that I don't believe in the framework of personality disorders, but I don't think that they are... They're not as intractable and impossible, some more so than others, but BPD isn't in everybody intractable and for life and can't be treated. And some people with NPD can be treated too, but they have to want the treatment, right? And to do the work. 
So the thing that I'm trying to say here is, oh yeah, I, I didn't finish my thought, sorry, on the shame wound. Because when children don't get what they need and they feel emotionally unsafe, whether they're aware of what that feeling is or not, and, and many other kinds of feelings and painful things that may get set aside or denied or defended against, even in codependency, you start to separate somewhat from yourself as you get older because the wounded inner child kind of stays back behind in the pain to a degree and you move forward. And I've had lots of people, uh, clients with codependency say, well, and maybe what happened to them was, you know, it was hurtful and, but it might not have been quote traumatizing unquote. And so they try to downplay it and deny it when really if something wounds someone, it's important. But the thing that wounds children so so unfortunately easily and so deeply, even with uh, codependency being the trauma response or that response to that is shame, is being told that because you know, when, when children hear you didn't do this right, or you can't do anything right, or you, what's the matter with you, or all these kind of statements parents can throw at kids, and sometimes maybe not in the most malicious or intent-to-hurt way, but it hurts. And what's a message that, message that children pick up from a lot of different things parents can say like that, that are, that, that are shaming things? That shame wound isn't that you did something bad, or that somebody's saying you didn't do something good enough. It's that you are bad. And I wonder, that connection between, and some people don't realize they feel that way, because it doesn't mean you are bad, but many people feel that way from the shame wounds, because that's what they amount to, the way people start thinking about themselves. And it's not your truth. It's been imposed upon you. It's really important to realize that shame plays a big role in codependency. Shame and toxic guilt, toxic shame and toxic guilt. And then this idea that you have to perform, achieve, and do for others and make them feel better, make them feel safer, calm them down, whatever it takes to get their attention in the hopes that by the time you do all this jumping through all these hoops, they might be in a better place and they might give back to you. And sometimes in some people's childhoods, they might get something from a parent once in a while that they need. I'm, I'm talking besides clothes or an allowance or, you know, I'm talking about emotionally. And some people never do, but some people do, but inconsistently, which is really wounding too. So there's shame and then there's this toxic guilt and obligation, you know, fear, obligation, and guilt. And and it gets thrust upon you as a child. And it's not your fault. It's not your doing because nothing that happens to a child that wounds them or even causes problematic behavior in other types of situations or maybe with some people with codependency, it's never the child's fault. These patterns are created and it's not your fault. And then as you get older, you know, you might be more defensive. You might fear intimacy more. You might have, within codependency, a fear of abandonment. So coming back to where I started, codependency isn't this code word for you're bad, for it's your fault. It really is a wounding that happens in childhood, but that just doesn't go to the extent and degree, and for other reasons, I guess, of BPD or NPD, but it's Codependency, I think a lot of people try to minimize it in their lives if they're not outright denying it because they don't want to take on that, quote, label, unquote, because it's been associated with, it's your fault. You're a bad person. You must be, like, really weak or horrible if you have codependency, which isn't true. And so I think, I hope this will help somebody out there who might come across it and you might think, well, yeah, that's kind of what I thought about codependency, and maybe I do have it, but like I'm, I've been denying that and pushing that away, because that keeps people stuck in really painful places, often in painful types of relationships, 
situationships and other um, types of situations in life uh, relationally. And, you know, I have, well, still working with a client, but, but a client of mine said a while back, you know, that they felt that at their age, and let's just say they were not in their 20s, but they were not super into their 30s, but I just can't actually say anything about what their age was to, you know, just because it's a no-no. But so they they were younger than most people, and, and still are, I guess, um, in the, um, you know, the office, the company in which they worked, in which they were really performing well and doing well, and doing their job quite well. But sometimes doubting that, and sometimes unsure of themselves, and how to communicate, because a lot of people with codependency are conflict avoidant, and a lot of people with codependency can be the opposite. <laughs> they can be more really conflictual. So not everybody's the same. But so this client of mine said, he just didn't feel important or good enough or taken seriously at all because he was younger than these people he was working with. And it's just interesting because when we examined that, went through that, where did that come from in childhood? What were the negative core beliefs associated with that and more? It really changed quickly for that client. And so that's just one element. I mean, I'm still working with that client on other aspects of codependency that are broader and that are deeper and that take longer to process. But it's really interesting and exciting for me, but all, but, but I'm not, you know, when I'm working with a client, it's not about me. To see a client make some change like that rather quickly because that's just going to make the rest of that client's process even more um, hopeful for them and because they realize, wow, I really, I changed, I experienced this and I changed the way I was thinking about that. And it turned out that, you know, this client's boss really does appreciate their opinions, really believes in their expertise at their job. And so what they were feeling about not being taken seriously or not being seen and heard because of their age really went back to more woundedness in childhood and what were they told that created those negative core beliefs for them. And the other thing about codependency is whatever any individual has gone through in their childhood that wounded them. And lots of people go on in life and it's like, ah, it wasn't a big deal. And, but then you come to realize it's still affecting you might still be, especially after a BPD or NPD relationship, you'll be like, wow, um, mm. and that's, you know, it, and I'm not trying to blame people with codependency at all, um, because it's just a very painful thing that often happens. And I think one of the reasons, and I've spoken about this before, is that people with codependency who have so many unmet needs from childhood or have been abused and traumatized in childhood, haven't got what they needed and are really in a lot of pain whether they're aware of it or not that gets triggered by a borderline or narcissist and then that wounded inner child is really screaming inside because the wounded inner child is left behind in the time frame of the pain and the woundedness from your childhood and that's why there's a a dysfunctional unhealthy relationship to and with yourself because people with codependency can have a bit of a false self. It's not like the borderline false self, which isn't like the narcissist false self either. But there can be that element in codependency because the self isn't integrated. And that's important to think about as well. And I will be talking about some things that I've been reading that I just really disagree with that because there are they're mixing things up, I think, but I shouldn't say too much about that right now because the key core thing is the woundedness to your soul as a child and to you and to your emotional well-being and to your own relationship with and to yourself because you learn with an emotionally unavailable parent and or whatever else might be occurring in the situation of your childhood 
or an inconsistently available, um, emotionally available parent, or rarely available, or whatever the case. You learn that it's as if you don't deserve anything, or you're not worthy of it, unless you are doing a song and dance of pleasing someone else. So it sets up these patterns in codependency. And then I just want to add in here, which can be very controversial for a lot of people, and people get really heated about it, so I mean this respectfully. But I think there's a lot of trouble and difficult things that aren't very healthy about this narrative of the empath. And what does that mean? You know, and and I've seen places where people express that maybe they were codependent and then they somehow up leveled and now they're empaths empaths instead. And I don't believe that codependents are empaths are up leveled codependents. And I think that the especially online, but you know, there's been a few professionals write books about it that I don't agree with either. The empath narrative is just not a healthy one. That's what I really believe. And so some people will think they're an empath and not a codependent. I don't know how that's helpful because I don't really want to say too much about the empath narrative. But what I know about the scale of measuring whether one is an empath or not and what that actually means was came from, originated with the work of Sandra L. Brown, who unfortunately, I mean, it's a good book she wrote, but unfortunately titled her book The Sociopath Next Door instead of The Psychopath because sociopathy is really psychopathy. The sociopath really is interchangeable with psychopath. It's my least favorite word in the English language. But so the work of Sandra L. Brown when it comes to empaths and a scale that measures if one is an empath or not, was her work that was specific to women who were in relationships with psychopathic men. And the reason for that was because the higher the empathy, which then becomes a rather toxic kind of empathy, it's too much, right, to give. And people don't have enough, they don't have the ability to seek harm reduction. So it was really from Sandra L. Brown's work in this very limited area where she was working primarily on helping and educating and working with her clients, I believe, but helping women to get safely out of relationships with male psychopaths. And so I don't know that it could, it's been, but It was extrapolated from there somehow, somewhere along the line. And now we're hearing about empaths that are, uh, you know, will invoke that they can be a factor two, psychopath, whatever that really means, uh, or factor one, I'm not sure which. And that they think that they're narcissists as well. They can be when they want to be. And these empaths, they go supernova and they destroy narcs and all this kind of stuff. I don't know, you know, like, so I'm just putting that in there because a lot of people that may well be dealing with codependency really glom on to what has become a kind of cult-like in many areas, empath narrative, which I think some mental health professionals support and some don't, probably many don't, but it is difficult to talk about. So I just put that little bit in here to say that People with codependency can be too empathic, right? So your empathy doesn't mean you're an empath, though. But your empathy can get to toxic levels, unhealthy levels, where you're still giving even though you might be being abused or ignored or just not reciprocated to in return. That's important to think about. But even with all that I'm saying here, I hope that you really can hear that it's important for people to know that codependency isn't saying you're bad or you're to blame or anything really, let alone everything, is your fault. So I think that's a really key message because a lot of people are denying their codependency, which is going to block 
healing and recovery because they have probably heard that word that way. And or who knows, maybe people out there talk in a way that blames people with codependency. I don't know. And then the other thing too is it's hard when you're communicating, like when I'm doing the podcast here or my other podcast or on my YouTube channel. It's like people will mishear things. And then like there was an example. Somebody, um, I think I gave it at the beginning. Somebody said on a certain forum somewhere, that, you know, and they use my name, okay, whatever. And, but they're wrong, you know, they have a misunderstanding of what I actually said. But they said that I said that, that people with codependency are to blame for either getting with a borderline narcissist or being abused by them. No, I never said anything of the sort. You're not to blame and you're not responsible. You couldn't have known what was going to happen. You may have had a lot of unconscious patterns and not realize that you have codependency and what that really means. And so I never said that at all, just to be clear. And again, what I was talking about that somebody must have misinterpreted was when you're with somebody with BPD or NPD and then you don't know that, then you start figuring that out. It's not that you're responsible for anything that they did. You just have responsibility to get yourself out of there and to get some help, right? To heal. And and so I hope that I've delineated, but that's exactly how I said it before. And somebody misunderstood it. And I think the other thing that's important to know is that codependency doesn't develop in... It, it develops in childhood. It does not develop in the middle of your adulthood because you're with a borderline or narcissist. I'll be talking about codependency and CPTSD. What are the connections there? And how many people with codependency might have CPTSD? How many? I don't really think uh, P, PTSD would be as big in codependency. But so, you, you know, there's other uh, aspects of trauma responses depending on the, the severity of codependency that can then come into the poor and be part of what people with codependency are experiencing. And so it doesn't just happen in adulthood because you're with a borderline or a narcissist. That's when it gets triggered. That's, unfortunately, you might not see it that, this way right now, but that is the gift of these horrific experiences in relationships that break up and are really painful and take a lot of healing um, and processing and working to overcome and to find yourself uh, maybe for the first time truly connecting with that wounded inner child, doing the family of origin work and individuation work, getting your family of origin out of you. Because so much of what people with codependency believe, it's what they said or what someone said or what they didn't say in your childhood and so the thoughts the inculcating kind of programming results of what did wound you in childhood basically are now what you believe negative core beliefs and they're not your truth and so many people are stuck believing that they're not worthy or not knowing how to feel their own self-esteem, trying to rescue and fix borderlines and narcissists or other people because you don't feel worthy of just being loved and cared about because you're you. And why is that? Because you have this disconnection to the wounded inner child that needs to be healed. And so you don't really feel that great about yourself at least emotionally and relationally. You might feel really great about yourself in other ways, you know, that you really succeeded as an entrepreneur or that you just do a really good job in your career or whatever job you're in, which is great. But people tend to think that means, well, I can't be a codependent because, you know, it's like not going into the emotional landscape. And a lot of people with codependency, and it's a pretty much defensive 
defense mechanism, live too much in the logical mind and not enough with balance with your logic and your intellect with your emotional intelligence. Though again, when I say that, and I've said that about people with BPD, well, it's it's not to the same degree as people with BPD, right? You have some emotional intelligence. It just needs to be increased and improved for you to balance it with your intellectual intelligence and the things that you are competent and and competent in versus what's going on in your emotions and how to balance the two and heal what hurt you in the past because what we don't address just keeps maybe even getting worse inside but pushing the same patterns and that's what we really see in codependency and you know I had codependency and I recovered from it and the key thing about that is if we put ourselves back around toxic people we can slide back a little bit but we can catch ourselves really quick because we don't want to repeat those patterns and we'll be really aware of them after we've gone through the process of healing and recovering from codependency. So nothing is 100% perfect, but it's like immensely better, immensely more you living your best life and about happiness and fulfillment in relationships and ways and with yourself that you may not have ever known before in your life. So I think it's more important to talk much more about codependency. There is much more to say. I have read a lot of misinformation in the most amazing places, like in books that were published. There's one I read recently, and I can't remember if it was written by a professional or not, but I have to go find it and, and look and see. But And I'll probably be talking about that in an upcoming upcoming sorry episode of this podcast soon so codependency doesn't mean you're bad it doesn't mean it's your fault it doesn't mean that you're to blame and so hopefully people can really hear that because a lot of people believe that that's what that means and that's why they fight it so hard and deny it when it may well apply to them and then if you're denying codependency and it's what you actually need to work on to heal, you're going to keep yourself blocked and stuck. And many people do. Codependency isn't all about being a victim either. So people could be, could have been victimized, could have been hurt. But I don't, and maybe there's aspects of people, like when I work with them in, in uh, sessions, that there might be some really still part of self that feels powerless or maybe some learned helplessness which is akin to having been victimized but I don't see a lot of codependence even when I'm working with people that are actually walking around like they feel like huge victims so and that's another thing too that is positive but also partly negative it has a negative side to it because People with codependency were hurt, and that hurt was a form, one way or another, of victimization. And so it's another kind of denial, not that people have to be active victims, but it's okay to acknowledge if one has been victimized, as opposed to always acting that out, or feeling that you're still a victim or a victim of everything every day, which is more what people with BPD than codependency and some covert narcissists more what they do than people with codependency so just remember codependency isn't a code word for you're bad or you're guilty or it's all your fault or what the heck's the matter with you codependency is a response in and of its own right from childhood originates in childhood responds to adverse experience unmet needs some kind of wounding things to various degrees for people or from trauma. And not everybody's wound might be from trauma, but it will still feel as painful 
as if it was more, quote, traumatic, unquote, because when a child gets hurt, who's to say if it's traumatic for them or just hurtful, right? Only the person can start to learn more and, and figure that out for themselves. So again, codependency isn't a blame word. It isn't a shame word. And it isn't a, it's all your fault word. And, and, and I'm, I'm just saying when I talk about it, I want you to clearly understand that because I don't know if some people do use it to blame or shame people, but that's not what I'm talking about. And that's not how I would ever frame codependency either. So it's a formidable mental health, formidable mental health challenge that is very painful. And I think some people have had clients say this to me too. They think they're kind of doing okay. And yeah, maybe they realize they have codependency, but they haven't really touched the emotional center of the inner child to know just how much that is painful in its own right. So I don't want to repeat myself again. I just want to say I hope this was helpful because I think it needed to be said. And I don't think the codependency needs to be pathologized anymore. I guess that it already is. And my hope is that it will never be called codependent personality or codependent, well, it is already, but codependent personality disorder because it's a relational thing, as are a lot of personality disorders. But codependency has been left in this limbo place to be, by many out there, accurately described, but by many others, just the old school definition that was kind of ridiculous. And it doesn't make any sense. And can I just say too, and I wish I could remember her name. I got to look the book up. Unfortunately, I have it. It's a mental health professional from Ireland. It's a woman. She says there's no such thing as codependency. What does she replace the notion or her dismissal of codependency with? That if you have a narcissistic parent or you are with a narcissist, and maybe you didn't know that, and maybe just figuring that out, then she says that means people are, quote, co-narcissists, unquote. And I've seen a few other people say that, and I find that really irresponsible and aberrant. I find that it is meaningless. And again, yeah, it's blaming people with codependency, and it's not appropriate. So there's a lot more to unpack about codependency and the way it affects people and how many people are still probably denying it for that reason and many others but let me just say even though there are shame wounds in codependency please know there's no shame in actually being a codependent especially when you get into working on yourself working with someone to heal yourself then you will come to know you know, and heal and reparent your inner child, get your family of origin out of you, you will come to know independence and you will feel amazing about it. And you'll also learn, when I work with clients, the way I work, if you resonate with me, you will also learn how to not care to your own detriment what other people think about you. So again, Codependency isn't a code word or a dirty word for your bad or you're to blame or it's all your fault or what the heck's the matter with you. Not at all. And so people have to start realizing that, I think, and reframing codependency and what it truly is and being able to accept what it means in your life more than, quote, taking on a label, unquote. Thank you for listening to the Codependency Inside Out podcast with your host, counselor and trauma recovery coach, AJ Mahari. And if you would like to work with AJ on your codependency recovery journey, please visit ajmahari.ca.